I came from a big family. Eight kids in the family with my parents, that made 10 of us. We never had a vehicle larger than a nine passenger station wagon. We crammed ourselves into it and got where we were going. My dad came from an even bigger family. There were 10 kids in his family with his parents that made 12. And it was probably good that they came from such a large family because even though they had 12 or 10 kids together, his dad died at a very relatively young age, falling out of an apple tree. And his mother went to her bed afterwards in grief. And in less than a year, she died as well. And that left this huge family without any parents. And so the older children helped raise the younger children. My dad was one of the youngest in the family. And he's always appreciative of the fact that his older uh, brothers and sisters helped to raise him. My dad, uh, my dad had a real appreciation for his brother, um, Sammy. Sammy was one of the oldest in the family. Sammy was a lot like my dad in some ways. He didn't say a lot but he was intelligent, he was kind and considerate, and like my dad, he loved kids. When we would pull up to his house occasionally, it wasn't too often because it was an hour's drive away, but when we went to visit, I know that Sammy was always glad to see us. It was another story for Maxine, his wife. Maxine, she just didn't like having that many kids around. I mean, she wasn't mean about it or anything, but she kept her house immaculate. All her wood floors were polished in the place. You had to be careful when you stepped on the rug as you first came into the house, because if you were traveling at any speed at all, that thing just took off across the floor with you. I mean, she kept everything polished. I don't think she had a speck of dust in the whole house. I'm not sure how much effort it takes to keep a house that ordered and that clean. But Maxine did that. And having eight active kids suddenly descend on your home, that was a trial for Maxine. If it was good weather, my mom would send us outside. And uh, we would play outside, and that made it a lot easier for Maxine on our visits. But in cold weather, we were supposed to sort of sit there and not do anything and not say anything which was a real trial to us. My mom would spend almost the whole trip going up to Maxine and Sammy's house telling us that, uh, now you kids have to behave. Maxine just really has a problem with kids being around, so you have to behave. You can't talk, you can't move. You know, it's, that was the way it was at, my ma at Maxine's house. Sammy was always glad to see us. Maxine always dreaded it. I think if Maxine had her choice when she saw our car pull into their driveway, she would have locked the doors and turned off all the lights and pretended that nobody was home. They had a very different nature. Both good Christian people. But Maxine was very fussy. And Clarence was very relaxed and gentle in nature. But you know something about them? They had a marriage that worked. They had a love for each other. Now, they weren't outwardly demonstrative. They didn't go around walking hand in hand or exchanging hugs in front of other people. But they had a good, solid relationship together until my Aunt Maxine developed dementia. And then after about 50 years of marriage, Sammy was no longer able to take care of her at home and had to put her into a nursing home. And even though she had come to the place in her life where she could no longer remember Sammy, Sammy remembered. And every day he was at that nursing home. He would get there before breakfast so that he could sit with her and help her to eat in the mornings. He would stay all day long until it was time for the nurse's aide to put her to bed. And then he would go home and get a night's rest.
before showing up the next day. Day after day, he kept watch over her there in that nursing home. It was a Murphan family reunion. So on a Sunday afternoon, my dad dropped us all off at the park. He went to pick up Sammy. Because even though Maxine couldn't come to the Murphan family reunion, he knew it was good for Sammy to get away and be around family. Dad was a long time coming back. And after he came back, I asked what took him so long. And he told me, while he was there, Maxine had taken a look at her husband of over 50 years and turned to a nurse and said, why is this old man always here and why is he bothering me? That was hard for Sammy to hear. I wasn't there to see it, but my dad said he had to spend a long time convincing Sammy to come to the Murphan Family Reunion. After that, my dad knew he needed to be around loving family. But he knew his wife couldn't remember him. But the idea that he was an annoyance to her because she couldn't remember, that was hard, very hard for him to take. I could imagine it him hearing those words and that gentle smile of his dropping off his face and the sorrow coming into his eyes. That's a bitter pill for a loved one that was so devoted to swallow. The object of the love, the one they had been in a long time relationship, wouldn't be able to recognize them, wouldn't be able to appreciate them any longer. In our text today, we find Jesus asking who his mother and brothers are. But I want to tell you it's a very different situation. Jesus hadn't forgotten anything when he asked that question. So let's turn to our text this morning, Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. And there we find these words. While he was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. Someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. So we'll get that text this morning. I want to ask, what's happening here? Is Jesus disowning his own family? Because that's what it seems like to us on the first reading of this text, that Jesus is dismissing entirely his, his family here. He won't acknowledge his brothers. He won't acknowledge his own mother here. Seems that Jesus is denying his relationship to those who he had grown up close to. I want to mention to you this morning that in Jewish law, the son, especially the eldest son like Jesus was, the son who refuses to take responsibility for his aging parents was considered to be in, to, in sin in his relationship with them. And Jesus condemned that kind of disloyalty. Listen to what he says when he's accusing the Pharisees in Mark chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. He says to them, Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that I would help you, that, that would help you, is korban. That is to say, it is given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition which you have handed down. And you do many things such as this. So in condemning their practice of substituting man's tradition 
for God's law, Jesus talks specifically here about people avoiding their responsibility toward their parents by giving a token donation to the temple. And then when their parents were in need, they could say to their parents, you know, I would help you, but I already donated the money that I would use to help you to the temple, so I don't have anything to give you right now. They would use that as an excuse not to provide for their own parents. They saw it as a loophole to no longer care about their parents' needs or to try to help them out. That, to Jesus, was blatant hypocrisy for a person to look for a way not to take care of his parents. That's something that Jesus would never do. Jesus showed that he still considered himself to be under obligation towards his mother when he was dying on the cross. We read in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, the end of verse 25 through 27, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clophas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his own household. So here we have Jesus dying on the cross in agony. He's having a struggle even to get breath in as he's, he's hanging from those wounds in his wrists. He's hanging suspended in that way. And the only way that he can get air in is to push off that, that spike that's running through his feet to raise himself up enough that he can gasp for a few breaths before he sinks down again. They call that the crucifixion dance, that rising and that falling and that rising and that falling until a man's no longer able to rise anymore. The Romans had a practice that if the, the cross was taking too long, they would break a man's legs so that he'd no longer be able to rise up and he'd just suffocate on the cross and they could get it over faster. But here's Jesus struggling for his very breath on the cross. And what does he do? He sees one who's described here in this passage as the disciple that Jesus loved. That's John's way of identifying himself. He didn't like to mention himself by name, so he just usually inserted that phrase, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He sees John standing there, and he sees Mary, his mother, there, and he knows he's no longer going to be able to take care of Mary because he's dying. He's going to have to leave. And so he says to Mary, that disciple there, John, is going to be your son. He says to John, look, that's your mother over there now. And from that day on, John took care of Mary in his home. So you see, Jesus wasn't trying to get out of the obligation he had towards his parents. It wasn't him dismissing his family that he's doing here. He wasn't disowning them. So what was he doing? Jesus's mother and his brothers had shown up outside where Jesus was teaching. Now, notice this. They didn't bother to come inside and hear Jesus teaching. They stayed outside and sent a message in to call Jesus away from teaching and to come talk to them. So they had no interest in what he was saying here. They just wanted to pull him away from what he was doing. And maybe it was that Jesus was saying such controversial things that he was being scorned and ridiculed everywhere that made them want him to maybe tone it down a little bit. Come on, Jesus, this is, this is getting a little bit uncomfortable here. Why don't you come away home with us? They expected Jesus to stop his teaching, to speak with them. That's when Jesus indicates that the family he was born into didn't have the same close relationship with him that his disciples did. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? 
and pointing to the disciples, behold, my brothers and my mother. The issue for Jesus was that his birth family was seeking here to discourage him from doing the will of God while his disciples had forsaken their families and their occupations to come on the road with Jesus and to be used of God in assisting his ministry. So we see that contrast here. His family trying to pull him back and his disciples trying to help him on. Jesus wasn't wronging his family here. He was showing that no one could have a full relationship with him if they weren't seeking to do the will of his father in their lives. That's what he says specifically in this passage. That the one who wants to be close to him, the one who has a relationship with him, can only be those who are seeking the will of God in their lives. We can't have a full relationship with Jesus based on outward ties. It doesn't matter if we're members of a church in good standing. It doesn't matter if we come regularly and put our money in the offering plate. You can talk about all sorts of ties that you might have to Jesus, but he's not going to acknowledge your relationship with you if in your life you don't want to glorify God. What was it that Jesus said about that judgment when the people are standing before him and he has people calling out to him, Lord, Lord, and he said, I don't know you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Why would Jesus say that about these who are claiming a relationship with him because they didn't love God in their lives and they weren't living for his purposes and Jesus doesn't have a relationship with those who are not trying to serve the Lord. You can do all sorts of things to be a member in good standing with the church. You can be a baptized believer. You can be a regular attender. But you, if you aren't striving to do his Father's will in your lives, you're not going to be close to the Lord. And that brings one other thing up I'd like you to see this morning. And that is the close relationships that we're to have, that we should have in our own lives. For the believer, Jesus is our great example in everything. Jesus lived a life in human flesh unlike any other man before him. He lived in an ideal way. He lived without sin. He lived doing the right thing. And therefore, his life becomes an example for us in every aspect of our lives. Every area. We model our lives. We model our values. We model our walk with him based on what he would do. That WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's pretty old now from the time that it was very popular. But that's our concern in how we should live our lives. What would Jesus do? Because he is our example. We should show Jesus' standard for our closest relationships. Just as Jesus couldn't have a close relationship with someone who had no regard for God or who had placed God on the back burner, as it were, we should regard as brothers and sisters all those who love our Lord and are living for him. And we must be willing to push away any hindrance in our efforts to follow him, even if it's from someone who has been our closest natural relationship, even if it's the people that we're naturally drawn to, if they would hinder our walk with the Lord, they need to be severed. Jesus has to always come first in our hearts. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 37, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Luke records a similar teaching from Jesus. This may be a little bit harsher in the wording. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, he says, 
He quotes Jesus saying, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You have to sever those that will pull you away from the Lord, no matter how close they are, no matter how inclined you are to love them. You have to sever ties with those that will drag you from your walk with the Lord. And you have to encourage those that will make you stronger in your walk. Jesus won't allow us to put him in a lesser place. Any relationship with anyone else that would compromise our relationship with him must be pushed away. Jesus comes first in the true believer's life. In conclusion this morning, Jesus has first place in our hearts or he has no place. Just as Jesus reserved his closest relationships to those who were seeking first God in his kingdom, so we must do the same as well. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is more important than him. This morning as we come to our invitation time, that's the theme of our invitation time. Nothing is more important than Jesus. And if you'd like to say that for the first time of your life and obey him in baptism and go on to live for him, this is that time to make that decision. Or if you'd like to recommit yourself in your walk with the Lord, maybe you've allowed yourself to drift. Maybe you've allowed other relationships to compromise your walk with the Lord. You can make a decision to renew your commitment to him. Or if you have any burden on your heart this morning or anything that you're struggling with, we'll have men up front here that are willing to talk with you and pray with you. But let's take this time of meditation and prayer to prepare our hearts for this. Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to give you first place in our hearts and to know, Lord, the purpose that we have in living for you. We pray, Lord, that we might not allow anything to separate us from you. So, Lord, search our hearts just now and see what things that we've erected as barriers against you and help us, Lord, to commit to pulling free of those. Let your Holy Spirit, Lord, help us in this time to make a decision for you. This we pray in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.